Good morning. It's great to have such a full house this morning. That's wonderful. As you know, this is the first Sunday on our four-week series on poverty. When planning this four-week series, I questioned myself. How could I visualize people who are poor? Do I think of the working poor, immigrants, panhandlers, those who are on public assistance or SNAP, food stamps, those living in a developing country, a member of our church who retired and cannot pay her rent, or those 25% of the children under six in the United States who live in families who are poor. Obviously all fit into this category and you could probably name a few others. I also thought about how we in this church are affected by poverty and what we as a faith community are doing to alleviate this situation. Last year, we as a church committed to the National Church's Matthew 25 initiative. The initiative states, quote, to eradicate systemic poverty, the economic exploitation of people who are poor through laws, policies, practices, and systems that perpetuate their impoverished status. To eradicate systemic poverty, that's a big order. But here's how we start. We educate ourselves and we bring awareness to those around us. We plan in this series to discuss next week what the Bible says about <laughs> poverty with members of the Mission and Social Justice Committee reflecting on biblical passages. Then the third week, I will be sharing what our national church and what First Presbyterian has done and are doing. And then the last week, we will be looking toward the future. What can we do as a church, as individuals in our community of Santa Fe? But today we're going to look at two aspects of poverty, food insecurity and those living without a home. We're fortunate today to have Amanda Briegel from Food Depot talk to us about food insecurity and what Food Depot is doing, and Hank Hughes, who has a long history of working on the problem of homelessness. And we'll leave some time at the end of their talks uh, for questions. So I'd like to introduce Ms. Briegel first, and thank you very much for coming. Oh, I have one more section. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I really do have an introduction for her. Because she's a very interesting person. She is the communications coordinator of the Food Depot. She helped share the vision and mission of a healthy, hunger-free Northern New Mexico through the Food Depot's social media channels, press releases, Depot Dispatch newsletter, and speaking to community partners, of which we are one. After spending 12 years teaching high school English in rural Western North Carolina, Amanda moved to Santa Fe in the fall of 2021. She has also held the position of volunteer coordinator and coordinator of the child-focused hunger relief programs at the Food Depot. In her spare time, she enjoys traveling, volunteering, creating art, tasting new foods, and exploring the natural beauty of New Mexico with her shelter dog, Luna. So please welcome Amanda. And then go stand in front of the screen and we have Zoom people on here, so <laughs> that'd be great. Good morning. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Um, so as Judy said, I'm Amanda and I'm currently the communications coordinator at the Food Depot. Um, I've been there since the fall of 2021. That's also when I moved to New Mexico. And um, I love it here, it's a beautiful place. And I'm so excited today to talk to you about what we do as a food bank and also how we are addressing um, poverty as a food bank with our clients and through our work. And so we are a, uh, probably a, who has heard of the Food Depot or who um, has been involved somehow, the donor or volunteer advocate of me, <laughs> okay? So it's, uh, ha I'm happy to be amongst friends. So the Food Depot, um, I'm gonna go through a little bit of our of who we are because I found that sometimes people have um, been donors to us for years, but they're just not sure what the difference between the Food Depot, what a food bank and a food pantry is. So 
So I'm going to start kind of with the basics really quickly. So we are located right on Siler Road in Santa Fe, but we actually serve nine counties. So if you go up from Santa Fe County to Colorado and then over to uh, Texas, that's our service area. There's about 40,000 people that we serve within those nine counties. And we serve those people in two ways. So we have direct programs. And those are the programs that we staff and organize and pay for. And so those are things like our food mobile, which is that really big bus with the food creatures all over it that you might've seen driving around. We have mobile food pantries. Those go to our um, rural areas. We have a pet program. We have school pantries. The really big distribution on Silo Road that you might see on Thursday mornings. That's one of our direct programs. And then we have partner agencies. And these are our nonprofits who do their own awesome food distributions that they staff, they organize, um, and then they fundraise as their own organization. So as a food bank, our job is to procure the food, mostly from the Southwest United States. We also get food from grocery stores. And then our volunteers repackage the food. They um, rescue food, kind of decide this food is good for people to eat. Let's send it to our partner agencies and our programs. And then it goes out throughout Northern Mexico. So we distributed about 10 million pounds of food in 2022. That's about 700,000 meals a month. And those went to about 150 distribution sites through our indirect programs with the, with the partner agencies and our direct programs. So that's who we are, right? And our goal is to have healthy, hunger-free communities in Northern New Mexico. And right now, we, our goal, if we do that, we combat food insecurity. Have we heard of food insecurity? Great. You guys are so good. So food insecurity, right? The formal definition from the USDA, it means that if you do everyone in your household doesn't have consistent access to enough food to live a healthy, active lifestyle, right? And if you're food insecure, that can connect to other social determinants of health, like your living situation, access to education, access to healthcare, just kind of your social community circle that you've built. And so if you're food insecure, you're hungry because you don't have enough money in your budget to afford everything in your life that you need to pay for. And food usually kind of goes by the wayside. Right? So if you're a mom with kids, maybe you have to pay for your child care bill that week and you can't use that extra money to buy food for you and your children. Or during the winter, I don't know if you, but about you, but my electricity bill has gone up in the past couple months. So if you're a person who's food insecure, right, you're on a fixed income, and that means that you might not be able to buy food that month because your power bill went up and you had to use that extra money in your food budget to pay for the power bill. Right? So food has to go kind of as an afterthought, even though I'm sure everyone in here knows that when you've been hungry, if you didn't eat breakfast this morning or you skip lunch one day, like that's not something you need to do on a daily basis. We need that food. Um, but if you're food insecure, that can't always be the case because you have to use that money for other things. So that's what we are working on as a food bank to help people who are food insecure. And we find the two things that cause hunger are lack of, we have affordability issues with our clients, and then we also have access issues. Okay, so those two things cause hunger, um, and hunger is a symptom of poverty. So those are two things that also cause poverty um, in New Mexico. And so I'm going to talk about both of those. And first, I'm going to talk about um, affordability, right? Who has noticed that everything's gotten more expensive <laughs> the past couple months? I know I have. Um, the price of eggs has gone up, Right, 70% in the past year. Groceries are up 11% in general. Um, fuel has gone up in Santa Fe. Um, rent went up 13% last year. And so our clients, all of us, are feeling that strain. But if you're food insecure, right, your budget is pretty fixed. And so when things go up in cost, right, you have less money to buy food. When you're in the grocery store and your budget is small, you can you can't afford as much. Um, and so we're finding that more and more clients are coming to food banks to get food because they don't have as much money to spend in the grocery store. Um, and in Santa Fe, the average, well, actually 46% of people in Santa Fe make about $50,000 a year or less. Right? So if we're thinking about the cost of living right now in our city, with rent going up, with child care being about $6,000 a year for one kid, right? Um, if even if you make that $50,000, like 46% of people do, or if you make $15 an hour, which we might think that's pretty good, that's still $38,000 a year 
uh, working 40 hours a week, which is not a lot when you think of how much stuff has gone up. And that causes people to be food insecure because they have bills to pay. Um, so that affordability issue also impacts your food bank. So right now we're in what we're calling a perfect storm because we have rising costs. We have issues with accessibility for federal um, social safety nets that I'm gonna talk about next. And then as a food bank, we are having problems affording things as well. Like with the cost of food going up for our clients, that's also affecting us as a food bank too. So when food goes up, our costs are up about 40%. Our freight costs used to be about $2,500 to bring a semi from California, not $6,000. So fuel, when fuel goes up and our semis are driving 162,000 miles around Northern New Mexico a year, right? That impacts how much we are paying for fuel out of our budget. Um, so all of this stuff kind of ended up, it ended up that our foods purchasing budget is gone in the first five months of the fiscal year this year. It's, it's gone. <laughs> so does that mean we're going to stop feeding people in our service area? Of course not. But that does mean that we're going to have to be creative with our budget and figure out other ways to feed people. Um, we're going to have to go to our community and say, hey, this is what's happening. Food is costing a lot. We're seeing more people than ever in our lines. We have really great grocery store partners. Like we rescue food that comes from Market Street, uh, Walmart, Sam's Club, um, Albertsons, Dave Bakery. That's where a lot of our uh, delicious bread comes from. But those places are becoming more efficient, which is great. We love efficiency, but that also means less food waste is coming to the food bank. So our donations are going down from individuals because people are think the pandemic is over. Um, donations are going down from grocery stores because of efficiency, but we're seeing as a food bank more people in line than we were at the height of the pandemic because affordability has not gotten any better since the, since the pandemic started. So that's kind of what we're dealing with as a food bank on affordability and what our clients are dealing with as well, which is just increasing food insecurity. Um, I think in December, one in nine people in the United States were food insecure. And then um, the census is doing like community surveys right now and they're releasing data every couple of weeks. And in the end of February, it was one in seven people. So it's just going up. And in um, Santa Fe, um, there's around 5,000 children that are food insecure, Santa Fe County. And there's about 17,000 people that are food insecure. Does anyone have any questions about affordability before I go into Am I going too fast? Yeah. You didn't mention Smiths, I don't think. Are they not participating? They are, yes, they are, yes, for sure. <laughs> Both of the Smiths. Yes, we get food from Trader Joe's too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yes, we get we also get a lot of flowers. If you ever stop by your warehouse, you're sure to get some flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have a lot of, like I said, we have a lot of great grocery store partners. We're just getting less from them because they have less to give us. Um, so just kind of pulls and oranges, positives and negatives. Um, so the other thing we see that's causing hunger in our community and just across the United States is access. Okay? And so right now people have access um, to a lot of federal social safety nets. Right? So we have things like SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, have we heard of SNAP or food stamps? That's what it used to be called. And so we have SNAP, we have things like WIC, which is infants and, infant, infant and children. That's if you have a child under five, you can apply for that um, as soon as you get pregnant. Then there's um, things like the senior food boxes that have USDA TFAP food in them. TFAP stands for the Emergency Food Assistance Program. And that's food that the federal government buys from American farms. It's like packaged in the United States. And then it comes to food banks for us to give out to people. And we are actually seeing lower amounts of that food as well, which is an issue and why we have to buy more food. So those programs are available to people, but access is an issue. Maybe there's a stigma around it. People don't wanna apply for SNAP because they feel like they'll be judged. Maybe they think they're stealing the money from other people. Maybe they think that um, they just don't qualify, which a lot of people do. And then there's always an argument in Washington if we should save money as a country by cutting SNAP. So those are all issues that, have, that affect people's access to these programs. And right now, SNAP is in the news a lot because it's been cut some more. 
have we heard SNAP kind of going on the radio waves lately? We've been trying to kind of raise the alarm as a food bank because before COVID, SNAP benefits were not enough. So how SNAP works is you apply for SNAP, the amount you get on a little card, on like a kind of a debit card, is based on your income. And then you can use that card at authorized grocery stores. And you can only use it for food. You can't use it for shampoo, you can't use it for diapers, you can't use it for prepared foods. So if you're a senior and you um, or, or a working mom and you want to go home and make something really easy, you cannot buy a rotisserie chicken. You have to buy like the ingredients to go home and make the food, which is hard for people. And you can't also buy prepared foods um, or hot foods. You have to go to an actual grocery store and authorize one. And if you live in a food desert, which a lot of New Mexicans do, you have very rural counties, you have sometimes have to travel an hour to get to an authorized grocery store, which is also a problem with SNAP. So there are a lot of accessibility issues within these programs. And then there's also accessibility to the program to the like to be able to apply for the program itself. So right now SNAP is in the news a lot because before COVID, there were issues with the program. But during the pandemic, the federal government said, hey, we're in a, an emergency, let's give people some more money. And that was a great idea, right? So people saw about $90 a person increase in their SNAP benefits. So if you're uh, a senior couple, you had an increase to about $281 a month in your SNAP benefits. Well, that emergency allotment now ended in February. So now in March, anyone want to guess how much their benefit is going to be? It's a sad number. $280 less. If you're very close. It's only going to be 23 so it's $23 for a month. For no way, like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever Thank you. <laughs> you think I'm more for the food depot. <laughs> it is. And that's why we're worried as a food bank, because that's why people are hungry. That's why people cannot afford things. So even though the federal government said, hey, we're in an emergency, let's increase SNAP benefits. And everyone said, hey, that's a great idea. People need more money for groceries. Now they're saying, hey, people don't need this extra money anymore. And all the food banks are saying, hey, wait, things have not gotten better with affordability since the pandemic ended, right? So we're seeing that people's average amount is going to be $6 a person a day for food. But you can't, you can't even barely buy a dozen eggs in the grocery store for $6 a day. And then in Washington right now, Congress is talking about cutting SNAP as part of the, as part of the federal budget. We're talking about cutting SNAP in the farm bill, which I'll talk about a little later. So we as a food bank constantly say, cutting SNAP is not the answer. Instead, we need to increase access to SNAP. We, there, there have been lots of studies that have found that requiring work for SNAP, requiring more work for SNAP, that's constantly in discussion in Washington, doesn't increase people's participation in the program, it decreases it. So are we trying to get people to sign up for something to be able to afford food? Or are we trying to say, hey, you have to work to be able to get this money, to be able to have food. But how can people work? How can people take care of their kids if they can't even eat? We need to be able to get people to eat. That's the, the very difficult, that's an important foundation. Um, so right now we are really worried about SNAP. Um, we are, um, I lost track of where I was in my, my timeline. Um, we're really worried about SNAP. Um, we try to uh, and help people sign up for SNAP as a food bank. We do have two what we call navigators. We have a navigation program that started right before the pandemic, like in the fall of 2019. And what navigators are, they basically are, they answer the phone at our food bank and say, hey, how can I help? You? Can I connect you to food? Can I connect you to other nonprofits in Santa Fe for rent, for food, for, house, for housing, for child care, whatever? Um, and so we, since we think that solving hunger um, means that we have to address affordability and accessibility, we're trying to remove barriers to access for these programs. So even as we advocate to the federal government to, you know, increase SNAP benefits and decrease these barriers that people have to the program, we say as a food bank, hey, let's help people sign up for this. Let's help people get the benefits they can get. And then we also, in our own programming, we try to make it as easy as possible for people to get food. So if you come to our line on Thursday morning, you can come pick up for someone else. We don't ask you your name. We don't ask you your income information. We just say, hey, how many families do you want to pick up food for? One or two. And then how many people live in those households so we can have kind of our data of the number of people we're serving. So that's kind of our way as a food bank to say we're going to make it as easy as possible 
um, to give people food. Some of our programs give out government food and we do have to ask people for their income, but we just say, hey, does your income fall in this little bracket? And if you tell us yes, we believe you. We don't need to see your power bill to make sure you live in the county. We don't need to see your bank statements or anything. So we do try to have very low barrier access to our own programs. So that's what we're doing as a food bank. And then on the kind of local, state, and federal level, we are trying to just advocate for food banks. So that means advocating for access for um, better pay at jobs, right? A living wage. That means advocating for the social safety net programs. And we do that through our legislative priorities. So I have lots of papers over there that you are welcome to take with you when you leave. If you've heard of this stuff, you can give one to a friend. You can also find all of these on our website, which is just thefooddepot.org. So we have papers like this that we put out every legislative session, which you can find. And then you can just email this to your legislator in New Mexico and say, hey, this is what I support. Please pass it, right? Because these are things that you know if you support the Food Depot, the Food Depot and actually all five food banks in New Mexico are supporting to help lift people out of poverty. And those, these are things like universal school meals. Have we heard of SB4? That's going through the legislature right now. It just passed the Senate Finance Committee and now there's other steps to that process. But that basically is for $100 a year, less than, uh, less than $100 a student for the year, we can provide universal breakfast and lunch for every single kid in New Mexico. And that is what we think of as like a foundational way to help lift families out of poverty. If students are eating food at school and everyone has access to that food, then no one feels judged that they're getting free meals. You don't have to worry about paperwork. Hey, what's your income? Fill out this form. Hey, bring back that form, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to worry about the debt that school systems build up because students can't pay their, their um, bills. And everyone just gets to eat. You have less students being absent or going to the nurse because they're sick because they didn't eat. Schools that have more access to food have better graduation rates. And I don't know about you, but I want students in our county, in our state, to be graduating from school and being able to contribute back to our society. That lifts us all up, not just those, those kids. Um, so we're advocating for things like that as solutions to poverty. Um, we're advocating for things like um, the governor's food initiative, that helps farmers in New Mexico. We don't have things like canneries in New Mexico. We send all of our food outside the state and then some of it comes back in. But most of it goes other places. So we need canneries in New Mexico. We need um, large animal processing plants. So that way all that good meat that we have on our ranches stays in our state and feeds our people. And so things like that can help build up our agricultural um, community and our whole food system in our state. So paying attention to the things that your food banks are advocating for and then lifting your voice for those will help our entire society and help lift us out of poverty. We also do things on a local level. We have this thing called the report to the mayor. I don't know if you've heard about this, but this was our kind of big thing we did last year where Mayor Weber asked the food depot um, to kind of figure out how do I end child and hunger in Santa Fe? And I don't know if you thought we would do it, but we did. <laughs> um, we didn't solve child and hunger, we just wrote the report. Um, we need other people to help with the first thing. But um, we wrote this report and basically our task force decided that to end child and hunger in Santa Fe, we needed to first, the biggest thing was to raise the minimum, raise the living wage. We suggested $17 an hour was like a good starting point and then raising it from there. And um, there's the, re the report is over there, there's copies, and then there's also an executive summary if you don't feel like reading all 40 pages. But it has a really great, just like general overview of the problem, different things we could do. These are things that you can advocate for um, with your city councilors, your um, county commissioners, and things like that um, to help lift our county out of poverty, to help our kids that are hungry and their families. And there's things like task forces that the mayor said that he would um, form that haven't happened yet. So you can do a little bit of encouraging. Um, but this is something that we as a food bank really support. And this is kind of our guiding principle of how we see um, poverty in our area going away. And poverty can be solved. 
a lot of people think that hunger is an issue that is just insurmountable, right? But we have the food in our country. We have plenty of food. We also have systems. We have social safety nets like SNAP and WIC. And we have those. We just keep cutting them back. And we tell, or we, you know, we're not giving people enough to be able to buy food. Or we say, hey, college students shouldn't have this, this access. So if we build up those systems or put things in place like universal school meals, then we can solve hunger in our state and in our country. So we can do it. Um, we also always have these fact sheets on our website if you're just interested in like hunger information. These always exist for all nine of our counties that we serve. Um, all nine of them are on our website under our About Us page and then also on our um, advocacy page. And this just kind of gives you a whole kind of overview of who's hungry in New Mexico, in the county you're looking at, and then just kind of other hunger data that you can share to feel confident when you're talking about hunger um, in our county. And then the last thing I guess I'll talk about is how you can help. So the first thing you can always do is come to our warehouse and volunteer. But if you're just like, man, that's not for me. I want to volunteer, you know, at Kitchen Angels or at the animal shelter or wherever. That's awesome. I'm a big supporter of volunteer wherever your heart takes you. But you can also donate money to us. One dollar can provide up to four meals. You can always donate funds. If you have connections to a business, you can encourage that business to host a food drive. Since our donations are down um, from grocery stores, always accepting like actual food donations from food drives. You can also encourage businesses or your book club or your Sunday school class or whatever to have a fun drive and everyone brings in um, a couple dollars and it goes to the food depot. And then the other really huge thing you can do is just raise your voice for food banks because people don't understand poverty. There's a lot of judgment around it. People don't know what our legislative priorities are. People don't know what the, um, the anti-donation clause is in the New Mexico Constitution. And that's a clause that is currently preventing state money from flowing into the food depot. And that's the reason why we can't buy our food mobile 2.0 right now <laughs> to go around to the rural counties. So there's money that can go to nonprofits, but there is a lot of roadblocks in the way. And so we need to get rid of some of those barriers increase access for people to, to get to programs, um, organizations, nonprofits to get to programs, and then help people be able to afford their rent with a living wage um, and not have to rely on food banks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our Mission and Social Justice Committee had an opportunity to tour the food depot on a little field trip during the pandemic, and we were so overwhelmingly impressed. And as you can see, their employees are pretty special. So um, I am thanking you, Amanda, and um, I'd like to say a little bit about Hank Hughes who is our next speaker. He's currently the Santa Fe County Commissioner for District 5 and recently retired as the Executive Director of the New Mexico Coalition to End Homelessness. It's a group that he founded with other advocates in the year 2000. Prior to his work at the coalition, Hank was a, the Executive Director of St. Elizabeth's Shelter. And I'm going to have uh, Reverend Jim Brown say a few words about him because Jim has had a long history with uh, working with Hank. I'm a little wobbly. I've just had back surgery. Doing great. <laughs> Each step carefully. <laughs> Amanda, I have a communication from you on my desk at home asking for a contribution that came the other day. I'm going home. To write a check. <laughs> I've, been, I've been supporting the, the food bank. It's a wonderful organization. Told a great story. Hank and I met in the late 1980s, and uh, then to jump ahead, Nina and I moved back to Santa Fe 10 years ago and discovered that Hank was running for county commissioner. In fact, his wife discovered us. She rang our doorbell uh, and asked us to get on board. And uh, so we traveled uh, El Dorado and met people we'd never met and went down streets we'd never been down. And uh, we're very, very pleased that he was elected uh, to be one of our commissioners. We met in the late 1980s. And 
some of you were here in the church at that point. Um, and this congregation was struggling to find its niche or niches uh, in dealing with the, the hunger and poverty issues, homelessness uh, in Santa Fe. We were serving um, giving out bag lunches from the front door of the church. Some of you will remember that. People lined up. We were packing groceries in the basement under the sanctuary, and people were coming to pick up food. And we struggled with the whole question of homelessness. Uh, it's very difficult to get a handle on it. It was very difficult back then. More has been done in recent years. Um, and so a group of us began to gather, and Hank and I were part of that, to see what might be done to find a, a place for people to live. It's a big struggle to find in any community housing. Uh, big, small, in between, uh, not in my neighborhood, is uh, a, an obstacle to, to overcome. And uh, we were making good headway. We had found a facility. Um, I who was out of town, flew back into Albuquerque, picked up the New Mexican to see what was going on in town. And there, in the back section, was a quotation in an article in which uh, one neighbor said, Reverend Brown is a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> uh, you may not remember it if you were living there at the time. I remember it well. <laughs> For he had been interviewed by the, uh, the press uh, about the housing that we had found. Toward opening up. Uh, and he was very much opposed to it. And uh, uh, I was one of the targets, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, he in later years, became one of the most active volunteers in the program. Uh, once he saw the quality of the leadership that came in and the care that was being given, he became a convert. Uh, and it's a great story. He felt about him. I don't know if he's still living. I, I think, I'm sure he's not. He's an older man. Uh, but uh, that was part of the mix during those days. And, and Hank, uh, at that time and throughout his, I would call it ministry, mission, in life uh, has been someone who has been tenacious about caring for people who live on margins and outside the margins. During that period in time, I'll stop with this. Uh, during that uh, period in time, I read Henry Nowen's little book on compassion. Uh, and compassion is a word that we use carefully and not so carefully. Sometimes it doesn't mean much more than a pat on the back. And Henry Nowen in his book points out that the Latin background for this particular word is cum pati. Compassion means to suffer with. And that's a bit different than what we sometimes think of when we talk about compassion. Hank is someone who has in his life uh, and witness uh, suffered with in the sense of staying with it, becoming the executive director of the shelter, of San Luis shelter once it got underway and working wide community uh, programs to help folks by being with them and suffering with them. So it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, there's a whole gap in my knowledge. I left uh, for California in the late uh, 80s, and a lot happened after that. Uh, things like the interfaith uh, shelter and a whole array of things in town, food bank being what it is today. But Hank has been one of the pioneers and leaders in this community, in this ministry, of suffering with. So I welcome you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, gosh, the Food Depot is such a great organization. I was just thinking of all the things the county needs to be doing to support their work and, and the idea of raising the minimum wage to $17, which probably by the time we get a raise to 17, we'll need to raise it to 20, but we can work on that. Um, I like to tell about homelessness through, through my experience with one homeless person, my friend, whose name was Ron. And um, I met Ron while I was running the shelter in the mid 1990s. Um, he is uh, someone who has um, severe mental illness. And so the reason I ended up working with him, he was um, one of his one of his problems was paranoia, which meant that um, when he met with our case manager, he said, "No, I want to talk to the boss. I want to talk to the head guy." So, the case manager, a very uh, compassionate young woman, came up to me and said, "Will you just talk to this guy?" So, so I did, and I and that's how I met Ron. And what he wanted me to do 
was to help him get money from the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation to start a little business. Um, now, one other thing I should say, now Ron is mentally ill, but most people who are homeless are not disabled, are not mentally ill, do not have substance abuse problems, and do not stay homeless very long. So while we have probably 20,000 people in New Mexico who experience homelessness every year, and that's a lot, and that's bad, but a lot of them get out on their own. They, they may stay at a shelter for a few nights, they may stay with friends for a little while, but, but they work their way out. And if, if you're not disabled, you can usually get a job eventually. And, and you're not, you're still poor, and you're probably still going to the food depot for your food, but you, you, you know, if you're homeless, you do everything you can to not to have a place to live. And so most people get out, but people with disabilities or any kind of, um, you know, it could even just be a lack of skill or a bad back and, and, and they can't really do office work. Those people get stuck. And so Ron is one of the people who got stuck because of his, um, his illness. And another thing that, that he illustrates, and I found this out as I got to know him, he, his parent, he was an orphan uh, from a young age, and he was in the foster care system and was not treated well. His sister told me once that one of his foster parents used to lock him in the closet and he got upset, you know. Uh, and so, you know, that sort of made things worse. Now, um, when I... When I first met him, I think he had stayed at the shelter for a night, and that's probably the only night he stayed at St. Louis the shelter. He did not like staying in the shelter. He couldn't stand being around all those people. And that's one of the things that made me realize that the shelter was helping a lot of people, but it wasn't enough for most people. We really needed housing. And so just like in real estate, they say the main thing about a house is location, location, location. Well, the answer to homelessness is housing, housing, and housing. There is no other answer. There is just people come up with all these little schemes, like how we're going to. We had you said under George Bush, we had ten-year plans to end homelessness. Now we have binding lists and all that, and 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 some of these things are are good, but they're no good without housing. And so, I mean, Ron's a perfect example. He couldn't. He was so mentally ill, he couldn't even stay in the shelter. Uh, but he would come. He would come visit me and the other people, the case managers, um, who would probably be staying in his car, sleeping outside. So moving along to, uh, you know, a few years later, he, he, uh, he did get the grant from the Department of uh, Vocational Rehabilitation. He claims it's because I went with him and they were so impressed to have the director of the shelter come to him. Uh, he got a little grant. He set up a t-shirt business. He was able to rent a little house in Santa Fe and that lasted for a little while, maybe two or three years um, until um, he got you know, in fights with some of the people who were selling his t-shirts and he wasn't making enough money. And so he, he gave it all up and uh, hit the road again. And I probably didn't see him for a few years, came back and um, I uh, actually put him up in a motel for a week at one point. But by that time we were friends. I wasn't really his case manager anymore. I was working for the coalition to end homelessness um, at that point. And so what we, what we realized that St. Elizabeth Shelter, and part of the reason I formed the coalition was it was about housing. And so while I was at St. Elizabeth Shelter, we, we formed three housing programs. Um, so uh, by the time I left, we owned three apartment buildings at the shelter that we used to, for people to move into. And the nice thing about that was, gosh, golly, people got better. Um, I mean, some people, moved in and they only needed it for a little while and then they moved out. Other people we kept for a long time in our housing, uh, you know, those with disabilities, um, but it made a huge difference. Um, and so when we formed the Coalition to End Homelessness, it was with the idea of helping people develop housing all over the state. And so that's what I did for, for 20 years, not nearly as much as I wanted. We, I worked for a long time building a, a program in Gallup, New Mexico, which, um, is the hardest community to work in. I, I discovered as I was doing it. Um, I, I, I worked on, you know, doing housing in Santa Fe, which is, believe it or not, way easier. <laughs> um, I convinced the uh, head of the Santa Fe Community Housing Trust that she should develop apartment buildings that had room for homeless people. And they now have uh, three or four of those. Uh, so Village Sage, Stagecoach Apartments, and Solera Station. All were developed by the Santa Fe Community Housing Trust, and they have 25% of the units for people who are coming out of homelessness, and 75% of the units are just for 
other people who want to live in an affordable apartment. Um, and those are, those are actually the most successful model because it does not create a ghetto. It's not all homeless people living in one place, not all people with the same problems, uh, not a, um, an attraction for drug dealers to go take advantage of people. Um, because most of the people are paying regular rent and apartments are kept up very nicely. Um, so moving along a little bit, you know, Ron finally uh, gave up on New Mexico, but it was after one, one day he was living in an apartment, he was fine, but um, he called me early in the morning, he said, I got to go to the ER, will you give me a ride? <laughs> so anyway, I went, picked him up, took him to the ER. And, and what was very interesting was uh, he'd obviously been there before and the doctors did not treat him very well. I mean, he, he knew what drugs he needed to bring his mental health into, uh, into, into line. And it wasn't like he was asking for heroin or anything. It was a, a prescription drug. I was just surprised at how, um, you know, obvious it is that the homeless people spend a lot of time in the ER and they don't the doctors get discouraged because they can't help that much. They can help for the day, but even that they get they get upset about. Um, so that was a little bit eye-opening for me. He finally got his medicine. I took him home. He was fine uh, for then. Um, but I think you know what we're doing now in Santa Fe. Um, Mayor Weber is great. He commissioned this study, but he also is asking always what he can do about homelessness. And so the city got a fair amount of CARES Act money um, and uh, the coalition, at the coalition, I had already been approached by the owners of the San Jose Suites Hotel, which is was a residential hotel. It's down by uh, Albertsons on Zia Road. And he wanted to sell it. He was retiring. The owner was retiring. He had plenty of money. He, did, he just wanted to get out of the business. And he really wanted his hotel to be used for something good in the community. He was, uh, interestingly, a devout Hindu. He would come to New Mexico and go with my other friend up to Taos, where there's a, a Hindu ashram, I guess they call it or something. Uh, I'm not Hindu, so I don't know about that. But anyway, devoutly religious man, and he really wanted his place to be used for good. So he had approached me. The city said, we have money. I said, let's get you two together. And so that's why we bought Santa Fe Suites. Uh, the coalition didn't have any financial interest, but we were kind of the catalysts. To, to make that happen. And so that is now yet another program uh, eventually got turned over to St. Elizabeth Shelter. So uh, St. Elizabeth Shelter now has another building that they can operate. And that was 120 units of housing. And so it was supposed to be, uh, the, the digital design was supposed to be like um, 75, 25 of, with only a few of the units going to formerly homeless people, but they had such a need, they actually are renting to way more than the 25%, which makes it a little harder for them to operate, but also helps helps a lot more people. Um, so, you know, skipping around, I want to I want to end my my story with Ron, and it's it's a it's a happy ending in that he got housing in Montana, his home state. It, it's easier to get public housing up there. So, he gave up on New Mexico for the last time. He he went back home and, and got a nice little apartment in Montana. Um, but then, you know, in his 50s or so, he got cancer. Um, he came down to visit me one last time, uh, visit me and his other friends in New Mexico. He had kept in touch with people. He was a very social person. And in fact, when he was um, not helping himself, he would take his friends into the Social Security office and get them signed up for Social Security. He, you know, he was so persistent. He was, he was a Extremely annoying person. <laughs> I, 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 people tell you, but I am I am sure he got a lot of people on social security disability just because you know they would say, okay, just sign them up. And get them out of here. <laughs> um, so he did help a lot of people. He was he was a very he, he definitely was a compassionate person, despite the fact that he was annoyed. He annoyed me and my family. So <laughs> so un unfortunately I was. But driving home, I remember Bonnie was driving the car. We were we were commuting together, and I got a call on my phone from a Montana phone number, and the the caller ID said a uh, county court. So unfortunately, Ron had had passed away, and uh, you know by himself in his apartment. And when they did a welfare check, he was he was gone. Um, 
And that just, I just, it just, but it illustrates another point. He was probably about 60 uh, when he passed away. And that is old for a homeless person. Uh, a lot of homeless people die very, very good. Being homeless is probably like living before there was civilization. Um, because you don't get good health care. Um, you, you get enough food to eat, but it's not healthy food. Um, and uh, and then, you know, you don't get early detection health care. And so, you know, you do get health care eventually, but it's usually in the emergency room. Um, he was on Medicaid, so he got, you know, eventually got good care. But he had obviously not taken care of his body very well. And so he did pass away, like many homeless people, at, at an age that was much too young. And, um, and so that's why, you know, I think really homelessness is just because we don't spend enough money on housing. And, you know, really, really we, we can blame one person for that, and his name is Ronald Reagan, because when he came in office in 1980, he slashed the housing budget by two thirds, and it has never, ever, ever come back. And that's why, you know, you go to, politicians, I'm one now, but I don't know. <laughs> but people come up with these schemes, like we're gonna end homelessness by concentrating on this group of homeless people or that group of homeless people. And no one's willing to say that, you know, for the price of like, you know, one one hundredth of the defense budget, we could just have provide enough housing for people. And that's really the answer. So I'll, I'll stop now and see if we have questions for me or for Renee. Um, why don't we, I don't, state where you are <laughs> um uh, any questions first of all for hank and then and then we'll or address them to amanda and amanda can come up and zoom people we uh gail will be watching to see if you have questions i see uh one hand up already so um it looks like jim elliott has his hand up or am i looking no. at that wrong no I think it's just your cursor. Oh, it's okay. your cursor. Yeah. Okay. I'll move it off. Questions um, <laughs> for either of the two. I know it's a wealth of information to take in right now. Um, George. Your experience um, with St. Elizabeth, but also with all the through the years with homelessness. What does the management of something like uh, uh, what was it? facilities, uh, sanitary suites, or any other facility, what is the management like? I know the management of the, the, uh, the interfaith shelter is a dynamic thing, but. Well, that's a good question. And and so, um, I mean, the, the Santa Fe Suites is under St. Elizabeth Shelter. That's just the nonprofit that, that runs it. Um, but they, that's a good, very good question because there is, of course, the property manager who, uh, which is a separate company that maintains the apartments, collects the rent from people. Um, and then there's a whole other side, the St. Elizabeth Shelter maintains of case managers who are social workers who are there to help people. And um, I mean, what, what often happens with homeless people is, you know, they may be fine for a while and then all of a sudden they need someone's attention, you know, for a week. And so you could have someone who takes up 20 hours of your time a week as a case manager. And so it takes a lot of case management to, to you know, keep these things going. And then, you know, then you get that person settled and someone else wants that kind of crisis. But, but it's sort of the combination of social services and property management, whereas a, an apartment building that didn't do that would just have property. Lynn? I have never understood the concept if you are a builder, from what I've read in the paper, you're a builder and you want to put up 50 apartments, but you want to buy out, so none of them have to be low income. You only have to pay $10,000. So my question, maybe you could explain that. And then I'm wondering if it is $10,000, why is it so low? Because there's so much profit to be made on the apartment building with the middle and upper income rentals. So why is it only $10,000? Okay, well, that's a, that's a, a good question for the city, um, but I know part of the answer. Um, because I'm a county commissioner and our program's a little different, but maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about all of that. Um, so the city, when it did it in its inclusionary zoning ordinance, did not have a buyout option at first. And so the, the deal was, and I don't remember their percentages, but if you build um, a development with 100 homes, a certain number of them had to be affordable to people 
at the lower income levels. Um, and that is still the case in both the city and the county. If you build a, a development with more than like two houses or something, you have to do a certain number of portable. And there is no buyout option. If you're going to build 100 houses, you absolutely have to build in the county, it's 15%. You have to build 15% and sell those to qualified buyers at the lower income levels. Now for apartments, it's different. What happened with apartments, there was a similar requirement, um, but all that did is no apartments were built. You may remember that before previous years, there were many years where we had no apartments being built in Santa Fe. And that's because the developers' apartments are, of course, they're uh, what do you call it, a low, low profit margin compared to building houses. So the profit margin is already not great. I mean, there is a profit and they make money and that's why they do it, but in, you know, in our capitalist system, but they were just not building any apartments. And they said it was because, and I believe as they said, well, you know, for the first few years, of course we can keep some apartments affordable, but as our costs increase, we can't keep, you know, for 30 years or whatever the requirement was, 15% of our apartments affordable. It just doesn't work financially for us. So that's why the city decided to have the, the fee in lieu. In other words, you can build your apartments, you rent them at whatever rent you want, but you pay a fee. And I don't know what the fee is. It's, 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 it's probably too low, but I know that they're also getting an awful lot of money combined into their trust fund from it. So they easily have $3 million a year now from some of these, it's part of it's from the fee loop, part of it I think they supplement. But, so I think what we need to do next is um, there is no requirement, so, so they can charge whatever rent because that's what they need to build the apartments and be able to afford it. Um, we need to have a requirement in Santa Fe. They just instituted this in Albuquerque. Albuquerque is the first place to do this, where if you own an apartment building, you are not allowed to discriminate against people who have vouchers. And so in other words, we there's all kinds of public housing vouchers. You've probably heard of Section 8 or public choice vouchers. There's vouchers for veterans. There's another set of vouchers for homeless people. And the vouchers allow people to live wherever they want to. And the voucher pays most of the rent. And then the tenant pays 30% of their income. Their income is very low. Their rent is very low. You know, their portion of the rent is very low. Um, and unfortunately, what happens is a lot of apartment buildings say, well, you know, this is a nice apartment building, so we're not taking any of those people. And so, so I think um, rather than worry about the fee and lieu being too low, what we need to do is say, if you own an apartment building, you have to take a little bit of everything. It'd be the next step. And so another thing for us to work. Yes. Well, I just been. I think for myself, even, and it's embarrassing a little bit to say this, but it is the truth. And you mentioned it earlier, it's not in my neighborhood. I mean, I I absolutely support affordable housing. You know, but when it comes right down to it, do I want an affordable housing complex that's adjacent to where our home is? And so I think that that's one of the biggest things for everybody to work on is really how do you understand the reality of living next to an affordable complex? And then what kind of educational process is in place to help all of us understand that it's not as scary as maybe you would think it is? Well, yeah, I mean, I think there is education. I mean, one of the things that, I don't know, I try to explain to people is that, you know, if people are in housing, then they're not homeless anymore. People say, I don't want to live next to a homeless person. Well. If they're in housing, <laughs> they're not homeless anymore. And, and the thing about housed people versus homeless people is that housed people all behave kind of the same. In other words, if they want to have a drink, they have it inside in front of the TV. Homeless people are the ones who drink outside because they don't have a place else to do it. And so, you know, it's not as scary. I think that's the other really good thing about the mixed income model is because you're not telling people we're going to put you know, 75 homeless people next door to you were saying, we're having, you're gonna have a regular old apartment building and some of the people will have been coming out of homelessness, but others will not. Um, and so, um, and that's the other good thing about the voucher program is it allows people to live, you know, mixed up with all the rest of us, which is really the best for everybody. 
And, you know, most of the homeless people I've met, and I've met thousands of them, are very nice people. I wouldn't mind living next to them. I would not have wanted to live next to Ron. <laughs> um, one of the reasons I was able to remain such good friends with him is because he moved to Montana. And he would call me, but we, he wouldn't call me to come pick him up at five in the morning to go to the hospital after he was living. Yeah, anything else? I, I don't have my watch. What, are we doing okay on time, or do we have a couple more minutes? Three minutes. We do, but it's yeah, three minutes. Uh, two minutes. Our uh, services at questions for Amanda. I know she covered so much that I feel like we've really been educated this morning by both of them in so many ways. Um, I have a couple announcements I'd like to make at at the end. So, hey, thank you yeah, so ahead. much. Thank you. I'd like to ask Amanda a specific question. How much do you pay for the church? 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 How much do you pay for um, well, most of it does come from individual donors. I can not really sure the exact amount. I'll pick it up really quickly. Um, but it's I know it's gone down um, 11 percent since last year. So I think last year about 26 percent of all of our donations were from people, and then we have corporations and then other things. Um, I can look it up in the um, Christian. Christian. Uh, uh, Amanda, <laughs> Amanda, I'm I'm with, um it sounds like Food Depot doesn't do this, but you mentioned the issue of people with SNAP not being able to bu buy something that's prepared. And I just think that's such a big issue in poverty because people are working two jobs perhaps mm -hmm. and like you just can't make a meal for your kids. It's so um you're so tired and then the you know, if you go to McDonald's or something, it's actually more expensive, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So is there something that, that, is there a way that gets addressed? I mean, delivering to seniors who are perhaps not able to drive is something that I think is very common, but what about a family that just needs a meal? Um, well, right now, every five years, the farm bill is reauthorized. Uh -huh. uh, and so the farm bill is actually where the rules for SNAP and TFAP get redone every five years. And that's something that like we're advocating for um, is rules for like college students to be able to be on um, SNAP without a work requirement because they're going to school. So I mean, going work at the same time, um, things like what you can buy with your SNAP benefits. So right now there's actually a comment, comment period open for, um, for USDA to like hear what you want to see in the farm bill, or you can email like your legislators, your Congress people in Washington and say like, here's things that I care about with SNAP. So really that's where we can change SNAP rules is through the farm bill. And it only comes on the federal level. Like that's just built into the program that they've thought for years that oh, if people go buy rotisserie chickens, they'll sell them on the side of the road. And they want to come at home. <laughs> so just like that all the time. <laughs> so just like addressing that judgment between for people that people on SNAP need that money to buy their food they're going to go home and use it to feed their families um and we need to be able to have them buy food that they they need so yes you can definitely put that as like a thing that you want your legislators to care about as they're redoing the rules for snap like this year and then after they redo them it's not going to happen again for five more years mm -hmm. so yes mm -hmm. thank you really just, just have one oh, yeah. follow-up question on snap mm -hmm. and issues um my experience is very limited with this, but I do see that people qualify based on their income and the federal mm -hmm. poverty level and size of the family. But all of a sudden, if you make just ten dollars over that, all of a sudden it's all gone. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that can be a major setback. Just when you stand somebody up, that take away this huge chunk of benefit that we're getting. Is there are you looking at sort of phasing out the benefits once you get above the federal? guidelines so they can sort of phase it out over time so it's just not a oh you get ten dollars over the limit because you got a job which we told you to get 
because you have to work to get the benefit. But now that you're working, we're not going to give you the benefit. Mm -hmm. So are, is there anything going on that they're looking at that? Um, there are conversations around, especially seniors, and the, like social security increased, as I understand. And so now a lot of seniors are kicked out of staff because their social security is higher, but that's still not enough with social security <laughs> and not having enough, like they still need the social security and the staff as well. So that's like another part of making sure that we're giving people enough staff. I think that like they have not looked at the income requirements for SNAP since the 60s, if I'm thinking right. Um, and so there's a great organization. If you want to learn like everything you've ever wanted to know about SNAP, and it's very like easy, it's easily understood. Um, I recommend an organization called FRAC, F-R-A-C. And they have um, a great like newsletter they send out every week that says like, here's what we're looking at with SNAP this week. Here's what you can um, email a legislator about. Here's what we're doing with the farm bill to teach you about that. Here's kind of what we're looking at. They have a bunch of data on their website dealing with things like that. Um, why SNAP is not really accessible to a lot of people. Here's why it's a benefit. And so I would really, uh, I'm not exactly sure what they're working on in those areas, but I would encourage you to go to organizations like that. We work a lot with FRAC and use a lot of their information um, just to kind of learn more and see like, hey, if this is what I really want to know about, this is what I want to really push or comment on with the farm bill or encourage people to change because that does affect people across the board on staff. And in May, we're going to have the same issue we're having now in March when the federal emergency, like COVID emergency ends. There are things like right now, college students can be on staff without working. That will end because the emergency is ending. So there are things that they build into SNAP and then take away. Um, and so they can add in things like, hey, we can phase this out or we can increase this benefit or we can have the, the income levels adjusted. But it just doesn't happen unless legislators here, people in Congress here, that we care about this. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you. The fact thank is you. really great. We're learning more about that. Well, thank you both of you for such a wealth of information. And um, I, uh, I hope that it's something that we can remember through this next coming month as we look at poverty and especially in week four when we talk about what we individuals can do and what our church can do. Um, I just want to put in a little plug for uh, Reverend Barbie's Zoom class on intersectionality because it really ties in with what we've been studying about women in January, about uh, racial justice in February and now on poverty. And if you haven't signed up yet, Gail's the one to sign up with. It's four <laughs> Zooms. And then uh, Reverend Barbie will be coming in May, May 6th, May 6th to do an all day workshop. Um, she's absolutely incredible. Gail and I have been on her Zoom classes and some of the rest of you have too and know that she is uh, really amazing. So thank you so much and thank you to our speakers, especially this morning. Thank you. Um, so in, 20, in 2020, 2021 fiscal year, we had 31,000 gifts and it ended up being about $10 million. And then last fiscal year, um, it dropped to 21. Thousand gifts, and but that's still eight million dollars. So we have incredible donors. Um, yeah. where our that make that our budget is thirteen million dollars this last fiscal year. So we cover that with grants, but our biggest contributions come from from individuals. And so we we love our donors. We cannot do all people without the community, but we're always you know since the need is increasing, we just let me know if you want. And remember, Amanda has some handouts over there if well, you're interested in more information. And if you don't get our new newsletters or if you go dispatch and you want to, let me know and I can sign you up. <laughs>